Okay, uh, welcome folks on this beautiful Scottish Sydney day. It's, uh, it's wonderful that I feel so at home with the rain pouring down. Uh, the only problem is with rain in Sydney that there's something wrong with Sydney's fighters who are such snowflakers and think, oh, I can't go out when I get wet. Same people who go to the beach all the time but for a swim. But it is, it is great to have you here. Can I just explain what we're doing? My name is David. Um, we're going to be looking over the next 10 weeks. Uh, you don't have to come to the hall, but you, you do get a gold star if, if you manage to come. But we're going to be looking at something, a book, three and a half thousand years old, perhaps, the book of Ecclesiastes. And what we're going to do in each one of these is uh, I will try and limit what I'm going to say to 20 minutes, which if you're an Anglican, you might think that it's either a long or a normal sermon. And if you're a Scottish Presbyterian, that's just the first point uh, in a 10-point sermon. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to look at this. And the idea is I want you to think about what's being said. Um, I'm not assuming that everyone here is a Christian. Uh, this is open for absolutely anyone to come to. And you're welcome uh, to bring, bring friends. You're welcome to bring your lunch in. Uh, the idea is that we will limit it to this period. And uh, at the end, we'll have questions as well. If you've got a, a phone, and most people do, and if you know how to operate it, which my parents don't, uh, and my grandchildren do very well, and I'm in between, then you can text in questions, or we can just ask questions as well. But you should have got one of these leaflets when you came in. Uh, what does God have to say to today's world? And that's got the passage that we're going to look at, and then some quotes, and then some information about the cathedral, and the services in the cathedral, and then uh, each week there's opportunity as well for you to follow up and have feedback, and I just need to give you a kind of warning. Um, I may say things at times, and think, wait a minute, what did you just say? Or, you know, I really disagree with that. And if you do, please speak to me, and we will, uh, uh, I'm quite happy to meet and have a chat with you, and Ruth is here, she's going to read for us in a moment, she'll introduce herself, uh, she's also uh, willing to, to meet and to, to chat with you, and George is at the door as well, he'll chat with you, but basically if you're going to chat with George, just remember you need three hours, okay, uh, but he's, he's a very friendly guy, um, but, I have We've entitled this, Why Does Life Appear So Random and Meaningless? Uh, I don't know if you read the Sydney Morning Herald, but I do. I read the Australian, the Sydney Morning Herald, and I read the Sun Herald on Sunday. And uh, Peter Fitzsimons, who doesn't appear to be overfond of Christianity, is what I would discern. Um, he had an article in there about our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and his religion. And basically saying, Scott, give it up. Most people are not religious anymore. And I thought about that, and I thought about the kind of depressing message actually that comes across. Because I think people are religious, but they they just have different kinds of religion. Can I suggest one of the worst kinds of religion is politics? I'm very interested in politics, love politics, but it's a bit like football. If you take it too seriously and make it your religion, can end up really disappointed. I think what we look at here is a much more significant message for today's world. So I'm going to ask Ruth to come and introduce herself and to read the first part of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and then we'll say something about it. Uh, hello, yes, my name is Ruth. I'm the today and to start this new thing and um, I'd love to get to know you, get to chat to you afterwards so do please feel free to uh, come and uh, speak to me at the end. Um, but for now let me read this first part of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, the words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. 
What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. I had a young lady come in to see me once, this was in Scotland, and my city is, was very well known for being a city full of drug addicts. And she was uh, a, a drug addict, and uh, she started coming to church. And she came in to see me one day and said, David, can you give me some of the Bible to read? So, I, I just had, I don't know why, I had these separate books of the Bible, literally separate. And I took Ecclesiastes and I gave it to her and said, come back next week. And she came back next week and she said, and I'll, I'll not, she had a very broad Scottish accent, so I'll not do that, but she did say this, she said, man, that was awesome, that was awesome, that was like Kurt Cobain on speed. Now, for those of you who don't know Kurt Cobain, the lead singer of Nirvana, one of the grunge Seattle band, quite a bit depressing, and he did commit suicide, and, uh, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, to me, it's the favorite description. If I ever write a book on Ecclesiastes, it's just going to be called Kurt Cobain on speed. She said, it's so depressing. It's the animals die and we all die. And it, what's the point of any, anything? Life is completely meaningless. And she said, that's why I take drugs. I said, okay. That's really interesting. I said, you're missing something. She said, what's that? Well, these next 10 weeks is basically my answer. We took a long time to get through that. We have, um, I'm just checking what we've got up here. It's a young, well, a young gentleman, an older gentleman, if we can move this on. This, please, yeah. This, as you will well know, maybe not, very influential, Carl Jung, the psychologist. Uh, and he said this about his cases, he said a third of my cases are suffering from no other neurosis other than the senselessness and emptiness of their lives. That's a, that's a very significant statement. Um, numerous other observations as well. I grew up in the Scottish Highlands. Number one cause of death for young men was suicide. I don't know the figures for Sydney, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be that much different. Why? In many years of pastoral ministry, one of the saddest things I've seen is people who've committed suicide. One girl who was a millionaire's daughter, who was a top student, who was a classical piano player, who had everything going for her. And one day she went home and back to the United States and just took out her brother's gun and shot herself. Why? Why do people do that? Well, you had that right. Wendell Berry speaks of his comfortable upbringing in the United States. He says, we knew and took for granted marriage without love, sex without joy, drink without conviviality, birth, celebration and death without adequate ceremony, faith without doubt or trial, belief without deeds, manners without generosity, such humanizing emotions as pleasure in small profitless things, Joy, wonder, ecstasy were removed as by an operation on the brain. I'm not the prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I will suspect that the number one issue in this city over the next decade will be mental health. 
I've been absolutely convinced of that. My wife is a mental health um, social worker, being involved in pastoral ministry. And to be honest, many of us who are Christians as well, we've gone through periods uh, of depression and discouragement. And why is that? It's that sense of meaninglessness. The existential writer John Paul Sartre was once asked, do you live according to your philosophy? And he said, no. If I did, I would commit suicide. And, and that's where an awful lot of people get to. Now this book we're looking at is written by someone called The Teacher. We think it was Solomon or someone in the Solomonic tradition. It's called Ecclesiastes because Ecclesiastes means assembly and it's the word from which we get ecclesiastical or church. And the idea that here is it's a gathering of people who want to listen to the wisdom of the teacher. So in 20th century terms, late 20th century terms, you're gathered here to listen to Yoda. Um, maybe not. And it's, you're not here to listen to my wisdom, by the way. Absolutely not. Never. We're here to listen to what God has to say to us, and that's why we subtitle this. Why does God, what does God have to say to today's world? And it starts off with a kind of something that's true, but it's uncomfortable. There are things that are just, ouch. So he says, everything is meaningless. The word meaningless appears over 35 times in the book. Now, if you dispute that, by the way, for today's culture, I suggest you go on TikTok. Um, well, I don't really suggest you go on TikTok, but go on TikTok and you think, seriously, is this what we've become? You know, is this where we're at in our culture? In this book, we're told that the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, that evil people prosper, that tyrants reign, that disease spreads, that everyone dies and turns to dust, that life is unfair, that nothing makes sense, that the whole world is twisted. And that's only part of it. Eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. What's the point of working hard? Because in the end, we all die in the end. But why is the book like this in the Bible? My friend, uh, her name was Pele, and sadly she died a few years later from hep C, but uh, contracted through drugs. But she became become a Christian, we became friends. And uh, she said to me, I can't believe that's in the Bible. Why is that in the Bible? And I said, I think it's in the Bible for people like you and me. Because this is the world we live in. There's a, I, I, I love this now. The weather outside really fits in with this. Uh, the fact that I'm Scottish and a Scottish Calvinist, even worse, that really fits in with this. I just love misery. I love Leonard Cohen. You know, my favorite movies like Apocalypse Now and Schindler's List, occasional chick flicks, but apart from that, you know, just the more miserable, the better. And this book is in the form of another type of ancient literature. There's an example called The Dialogue of Pessimism. What a great title. The Dialogue of Pessimism. Why should we put that out in front? Come on in and listen about the Dialogue of Pessimism. That will cheer you up in this, in this weather. It was a Babylonian work of the 14th century BC. And do you know what it said? If you remember the old television program, MASH? Suicide is famous. Suicide is the only answer to the problem of life. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, another Babylonian work, the god Shamash states bluntly, the life you pursue, you shall not find. And that idea of hopelessness is, is seen in different ways. So, think for example, the elderly Jewish couple looking at the smoking chimneys of Auschwitz as they step off the train, saying, well, what does all this mean? Where is this at? I think that it's sometimes looked as though in life we are presented with two choices. Either we face up to life with all its bleakness, its horror and its meaninglessness, or we escape, escape into a world of illusion and false hope. Football can be that, you know, the, like the proper football. I still haven't been to an Australian rules football match. I'm going to go because there's some reason that people 
like him. I don't know where it's at yet. I'm good. I'm going to undershine them. I'm going to grasp that something in my life. But football, I've seen, I've seen grown men who didn't weep over the death of a close relative burst into tears at their team losing. Because their, their sport has become like a religion. But there can be other things as well. We, we get very upset about characters on, on television. But not with reality. We don't face up to reality. So the teacher, what he's doing, he's challenging us to think through your positions to the bitter end. And that's what I want to challenge everyone to do. I want to say, okay, you believe this and you think this. Where does it lead to? 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 And what happens when you're on your deathbed? And all the things that you've given your life to. Is that worth it? Do you know the old adage, of course, that the, nobody on their deathbed says, I wish I'd spent more days in the office? Well, there are many other things as well that we spend a lot of time on. So, the verses that we read, uh, let's see if I can get some to work. So, see, um, i got to look up here. Let's see what I'm at. Yeah, let's stick with that one for a wee while. Um, everything is meaningless. Now, there's a a book of, in the Bible called the Psalms, a book of songs. And in one of those songs, Psalm 39, it says, You rebuke and discipline men for their sin. You consume their wealth like a moth. Each man is but a breath. And the word that's used there is a word that, that Solomon uses here. He says, Your life is just a breath. Now think about that. We feel relatively strong. Some of you probably don't. Some of you think... You're going to collapse and die, you know, every time you walk out the door. But that's unusual. We regard that as a kind of illness. But is it any more realistic to think that we're really strong? I had a wedding once in my church, and uh, during the wedding, I felt a kind of cold sweat. And thought, oh, this didn't feel too good. I better not collapse. I better just get the wedding over and done with. Don't want to spoil the wedding. So, finish the wedding. And after the wedding, I uh, collapsed outside in a pool of blood. And uh, for the next few weeks, it was 50-50 whether I would live or die. And when I asked at the end, what was my real problem? When I, when I recovered, thankfully, and I asked the surgeon, what was my said, David, you can breathe. And it wasn't hard, it was just a very, very simple thing. It was internal bleeding. And he and I, my surgeon was a Muslim, but we talked quite a lot about things. He, he said, the only reason you're alive is not because of me, it's because it's a miracle that you're alive. But we talked about the human body and how fragile the human body. And that phrase, life is but a breath, that's it. Once you stop breathing, that's it. And so, that's why he says it seems meaningless and futile. There's a lack of discernible purpose. Life seems absurd. The word is related to wind and to mist and is used for things that do not last, that cannot be grasped or are not worthwhile. Philip Yancey says this, that so many of us today have flat emotions, a radical indifference to others, the sensation of drifting, numbness to pain, a resigned acceptance of a world gone mad. In Camus' Le Tranger, The Stranger, it's a remarkable book, and, and Camus was one of these existentialist philosophers who saw humanity accurately but despaired of it. You should read his play and you'll see a description of COVID now. It's an amazing book. But Le Tranger is also an amazing book. The Stranger is also an amazing book. And uh, he says, by the way, um, I've read a very rare book by a Lutheran pastor who says that, and I believe him, that he baptized Camus just before he died, uh, that he became a Christian, which is very interesting. But in the Tranche, Merceau, the outsider, says this, it makes little difference whether one dies at the age of 30 or three score and ten, since in either case, other men and women will continue living, the world will go on as before. Why do you matter? Who cares? Supposing you collapse just now, like I was suggesting, and you die. Well, apart from being an inconvenience in terms of what we're doing here, and apart from some people who are relatively close to you who would be a bit upset, the world will just go on. Who cares? 
You know, we've been used to having COVID figures about deaths. It's interesting now that they've stopped. We don't, or there's so few, we don't get them so much. But you get all these figures about death, 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 death. And I remember one day thinking, I wonder how many people die in Australia each year. And it's, it's a remarkable number, 300,000 or something. People die all the time. And we wonder, well, why do we feel it that way? And why do we matter? And does it matter? He asked about work. What do we gain from work? He talks here about toil, physical labor, and mental anguish. It's hard work. On our tombstone, says one man, is the inscription, no profit. It's a big zero. You add the pluses in your life, you add the negatives in your life. They all come together and it ends up as a zero because if there's no meaning, there's no profit. You are a blob of carbon, as Bertrand Russell says, floating from one meaningless existence to another. Well, it's been quite interesting, by the way, that some of my atheist friends say, oh, your Christianity is so negative. And I'm like, what's your atheism? Are you kidding me? A blob of carbon floating from one meaningless existence to another. Love is just a chemical reaction. Do that on Valentine's Day. I chemically react to you, my darling. See how that works. We know that's not the case. He, he goes on to talk about this weariness that we feel, this restless weariness, that there's no emotional and psychological satisfaction. We, we never arrive. We're like the child in the back of the car who's going on holiday, driving up to Brisbane, and they just get across the bridge here, and they start saying, are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly there yet? We never, we're never there. We never arrive. We need, we need the next iPhone. We need the next experience. We need the next this. We need the next person. Just part of the bill and the gates. They're splitting up. It happens, it happens a lot. Why? How about there are things that appear to be new? Verse 10 says, no, that's an illusion. There's nothing new under the sun. But what about nuclear power? Is that not new? Well, technological advances may be new, but the people who wield them are not. We get really excited about new inventions that are going to change the world, but they, they soon sink down to our former level. In fact, the only reason that things seem new to us now is that we've forgotten the past. And then, that's what we find in nihilism. Past events are forgotten. Let's go to that one, yeah. Future events have been forgotten. Over 50% of Britain's under 35s cannot tell you anything about the Holocaust and do not know what Auschwitz was. He who does not learn from history is destined to repeat it. Now I know that there are one or two historians here, and I study history, so there may be a little bit of bias involved in what I'm about to say, but I do think that historians are the most important people in the world and should be elevated to the absolute top. Um, but I do think we do need to know our history. We really do. It's really important. I meet people today who can barely string two words together who are functionally illiterate and yet who genuinely think that because they're in the 21st century they're wiser than the ancient Greeks. Because they're in the 21st century, music is better now than it was at the time of Beethoven. Really? Beyonce, Beethoven, tough gold. You know, and, and, and we, we're not progressing. In that way, we're up and down and up and down. We progress technologically, it doesn't mean we're progressing in other ways. And technology may just mean we find better ways to kill ourselves. Okay, I'm going to ask Ruth just that she'll read the last verses 12 to 18 and say a couple of things about that and then I'll ask some questions. Much wisdom becomes much sorrow. 
the more knowledge, the more faith. I, I love that. You know, there was a guy called Bullard Zimmerman who wrote a song about that. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. You know, how do we know? How do we know anything? How can we find things? So let me just say, a couple, make a couple of observations here. Solomon had, as king, a very wealthy king, had the best libraries, the power, and the money, and he determined to study hard. And this is what he found, that there was a heavy burden that God laid on humanity. We may live as secularists, but the problem that we face are problems that are being ordained by God. We think and we plan. We've been wired that way. The idea that human beings get rid of their memory or stop thinking, I think that's what some people are trying to do in our culture, saying, just forget that, just live for pleasure. No, we're wired to think. I never ever treat anybody as if they can't think. We all think, and we all think in different ways. We may not all be academics. Um, sometimes if my mother says, good, Scottish uh, farmer's wife, as she is, she says about some of my academic friends, ah, oh, they're no wise, you know, they're, they need something, uh, like all one, bait and sandwich or something, they just need something. Because, and I think that that comes in as well. But the problem of the meaning of life, it's not a problem for philosophers, it's for all of us. Acts 17, 26 to 28, the Creator has instilled in every human being the desire to know the answer to life's ultimate questions. That's what distinguishes us from the animals. We, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm sure we'll get some wonderful people in here over these next few weeks. I do not expect dogs and cats and kangaroos to jump in and come in and, you know, ask about me and life. They really do not have that kind of angst. But we do, as human beings, that's part of what it is to be human. But here's this saying that I think is very important. You study, but the more you understand, the more you make. The wise man is wise because he becomes more aware of the scope of his ignorance and impotence, of the uncontrollable power of nature, of great evils which he's powerless to remedy. Do you know this? The first politician who stands up and says, I don't know and I don't think we can control this, is the one I'm going to vote for. Come fed up here in politics and say, we can do this, we can control the climate, we can control COVID, we can deal with this, we are great. No, we're not, we can't. The whole world's economies have been knocked flat by one tiny virus. And there are six billion of them. You know, the idea that we as humans control the future, our destiny. You know, teach, I know I think it's cruel to our kids, teaching them you can be whatever you want to be. No, you can. You just can. And so he asks, is, is that it? You know, if, if we're learning and yet we're, all we're learning is just makes us worse off, might we not just be better off just being dumb? No. There's a but here. And you'll notice in this passage, there's the phrase under the sun. Now that is used 29 times in this book, so 35 times the term life is meaningless or vanity is used. And then we find that it's 29 times under the sun. What does that mean? This is what I said to my friend earlier. I said, you know that phrase under the sun? You know what it means? It means without God. If this world is all that there is, then you're right. You're absolutely right. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Who cares about other people? Human beings are just like cockroaches. There's no difference. Who cares? But what if there is something more? And that's where this one God has made us in His image. And we have that awareness and consciousness of God. We groan. The creation suffers. And we know we have some idea of what is happening. Now, without God, the creation is meaningless. The Old Testament sees the creation as being full of God. But take away God and there's only meaninglessness. If you take away God, what are you left with? You're left with tsunamis and natural disasters with no explanation and no help. The Old Testament loved the idea of admiring the sky, seeing nature sing for joy, and the lessons taught by animals. I, 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 I will say to people, the reason, I, I so wanted to be an atheist. 
I envy an atheist. I really want to be an atheist. But I lived in the Scottish Highlands. And almost as beautiful as Australia. Maybe sometimes more beautiful. And I would go out and I would sit on the edge of 200 foot cliffs. My mother used to let me play on them. I still to this day don't mother issues thinking, well, I didn't like them that much. But go play on the 200 foot high cliffs something, okay? And I loved it. Um, and, but I would look out and say, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist, I don't believe there's a God. And then I'd look out and I would see the dolphins and I would see the sea and I would see the mountains and I'm going, oh, you're an idiot. That's like looking at the painting the Le- of, of the Mona Lisa and going, no, there's no artist. There's no artist. You can't do that. Of course there's an artist. It doesn't make sense without that. Romans 8 verse 20 talks about that and refers back to Ecclesiastes. What about history? Let me just say something about that. Um, is it pointless? Is it going nowhere? Well, no. The Bible's view is that history is his story. It's not pointless. And it's not a kind of Marxist view of history going from to the inevitable secular nirvana of the people. That's not the case at all. Without God, we are told there is no purpose and no new thing. With God, there is remembrance, and we develop a longer term perspective. Let me just finish with uh, two things. I think I've used the word finish three times. I'm a postmodern Presbyterian, so words are meaningless. Finish is all relative. Um, but let me just finish with this. Jesus says, you know that exhaustion of what am I doing? I'm working at this, you know, to use the words of the Swedish philosopher Bjorn and Benny. I work all night, I work all day to pay the bills I have to pay, but still there never seems to be a single penny left for me. Money, money, money. You burn out. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Job says of some people, they spend their years in prosperity, they go down to the grave in peace, yet they say to God, leave us alone. We have no desire to know your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? What should we gain by praying to Him? Well, I'll tell you what you gain. You matter. G.K. Chesterton, the Roman Catholic writer, said this, all men matter, you matter, I matter. It's the hardest thing in theology to believe, but it's what Jesus teaches us. So I look at you and every one of you matters. And I step out that door and maybe I step with someone lying, drunk. They matter. Everyone matters. But they matter only because God is there. And only because there is something more than just being under the sun. Okay. Um, I was going to play you a video, a video I'm not, and you'll be thankful, but I'm not going to sing for you. But we are going to have uh, some questions. You can text them in, there's some that have come in already, uh, and we'll do those. But you're also very, very welcome to, uh, to ask from the floor, if you like. Um, and I, I don't buy it, honestly. I, and you can ask whatever you want, you can say whatever you want. And I may almost certainly will not have an answer to everything. But let me just do a, a couple of these on here first. Um, many people, according to Wikipedia, leave lasting legacies. How does that sit with, with verse 11? If, I, if I'm debating or arguing with someone, they start citing Wiki and say, no, 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 that doesn't work. You know, they don't sign the fortune teller. But no, yeah, there are some. Uh, I, I guess there are some good things in Wikipedia. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. Say that's not true? I think it's true. It's amazing how quickly we forget. You know, someone very close to you guys. Um, my wife, for example, her parents died many years ago, and she still thinks about it, still dreams about it. Of course. But in two, three generations' time, who will remember it? We'll just be an item on a history search that, you know, personal family tree. We're not really remembered. So I found it interesting with the Anzac Day. Um, a number of people were arguing and saying we shouldn't celebrate it now. As a good old-fashioned former communist, I had some some sympathy with their with, with their viewpoint. Except this: these were largely younger people who were enjoying the freedoms that their ancestors had died for to give them. And I, I just I thought, no, we've forgotten. You've forgotten what this is like. And I can tell you how you can forget. 
One man actually argued this. I'm sorry, this is the world we live in. I don't make this stuff up. I wish I was in Canada. You know, someone said to me, there's a worse dictator than Napoleon and Hitler. And I said, who? And I was expecting Stalin or Pol Pot. And they said, Scott Morrison. I thought, okay, you're lacking a sense of moral uh, and ethical perspective. Whether you like Scott Morrison or not, I think putting him in the same league as worse than Hitler uh, it sort of indicates a lack of balance. And I think that is because we don't know our past. Um, I'll answer this next one, and then if anyone's got something to say, feel free. Otherwise, I've got a couple more here. He said that from an atheist perspective, it doesn't matter how long we live. Obviously, humans have intrinsic value. But how does it matter how long we live? How do we know that there is a design plan for our lives? Okay, this is why it's really good to ask questions. Because if I said that, I was wrong. I think atheists do care how long they live because they think that's the only life they've got. That's why you're so desperate to hang on to it in some ways. Until you lose control and you're more concerned about control and so then that arrays the horizon issues and suicide and euthanasia and everything else. But my point will simply be that none of us have control. We really don't. And When someone says, obviously, humans have intrinsic value, why well, obviously? We think that. But is that not because we're human? I think that the idea of human value comes from this. We're all made in the image of God. And that is something just absolutely unique and special. Richard Dawkins' favorite biologist, Haldane, said this, that he would care more about the death of a panda or even a, a single bamboo than you would about the death of a hundred Chinese. This is your classic liberal. You, you can't get more racist than that. But he was saying that there are some people who are more valuable than others. One of the most astounding things I read in Australian history is in the 1920s, packs of, of European men who came out here and went to the Northern Territories to hunt. Indigenous people. Why? Because they would believe they were less than people. Do human beings have intrinsic value? Well, why? It matters because we're made in the image of God. How do we know there's a design and plan for our lives? That's an interesting one, isn't it? You know, I think people, sometimes Christians will do this, they'll say, God has a wonderful plan for your life. You know, and then if they're a televangelist, the then going to say, and I've got a barrel, you know, or I'm going to tell you what it is and you're going to give me your money. Um, do you know this? Um, people will say things like, this is God's plan A for your life. Don't miss it. Well, I'm afraid I wouldn't plan double Z, or if you're American, double Z, you know, because I've missed so many. But I don't think it's this fix. You've got to do this and this and this and this and this. I just think, to be honest, I think life is... On one level, incredibly chaotic. I went to the house of Connie Ten Baum, um, a, a Christian lady in the Netherlands, who was, her sister was taken to a concentration camp and killed. She was in a concentration camp as well, because they were helping Jews. And you go into her house today, and they will show you a tapestry she made. And they show you one side of it, and it's just a complete mess. It looks like me doing knitting or something. And then you turn around and it says all things work together for the good of those who love God and it's absolutely beautiful. I think that's what our life is like. It's messy, but God overall is in control of it. And I ask simply, what's your alternative to that? Because you're not in control, who is? Just faith? Just the forces? You just shrug your shoulders and say that's the way it is? I don't think so. See, there's a reason you think you're here. Look, what Dan said was, in two or three generations, we will be forgotten. And you made a very a point I didn't make, which is really important. That who we are, our struggles and everything, will not be remembered. Because people don't know them. I think it was the Frenchman John Calvin who said, the two hardest things to know in the world are God and yourself. And to know who we are, that's that's really the thing. So why would anyone else remember? How would they know? My, my father is very ill just now, and I'm learning loads of things about him that I didn't know. He's my dad. He's been my dad for 
the 59 years of my life. So when you look at it like that, you think, what's the point? Who's going to remember? I'm sorry. I think we live in this illusory world where we think because we've got 5,000 friends on Facebook, we've got 5,000 friends. No, we don't. And because you get a like, you think somebody cares. No, they don't. They don't. There's a bigger picture. And I think that bigger picture comes in terms of God. A um, couple more things before we finish this. People did text in. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, I'm interested in some examples of how Jesus gives us rest when we're feeling weary. It's one example of the belief that God is sovereign and making we can trust Him with our circumstances. Do you know what He does? It varies, isn't it? With Elijah, do you not feed him with the ravens and go get some sleep? I, I think that our religion, if you're a Christian, is much more practical than people realize. You know, Psalm 23 says, He leads me beside still waters. Sometimes we go through the valley of the shadow of death, but sometimes we get still waters. And I think there are many ways to go to this race. Can I mention one in particular? Sunday, the day of race. We're all so busy, we have no time to race. What about holidays? Guess what? They are holy days. You know, chill out, take a rest. I used to say to our students, we have a lot of Malaysian Chinese students come to our church. And they were just like, we got to work, we got to work, because our parents are paying for this. And I'm saying, you're just going to say, yes, or I want to be able to say, well, God says you don't want to work on Sunday. You ain't working. And they loved it. And it really helped. So I think God gives us rest in different ways. There's a Sabbath rest, there's emotional rest. Ultimately, that rest only comes when we uh, get to heaven. A couple of others. Um, how does Solomon find meaning without Christ and the hope of a new creation? I don't think he did. I think in the Old Testament they look forward to Christ, and the New Testament we look back. So we read that Moses, who didn't know Christ, yet in Hebrews we're told that he regarded his grace for the sake of Christ as being better than all the treasures of this world. And that chapter in Hebrews 11, the all these Old Testament saints were looking forward to Christ. And Job says, I know my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand on the earth, and I shall see him, I shall see him in my own flesh. You do not get a stronger statement of faith in Jesus than that. So I think that Solomon did have some awareness of a Messiah who wants to come, who was going to sort things out. And to be honest, that's a little bit like us. You might be the person who's saying, there's got to be something more. And I'm saying, yeah, there is, and there's someone more. And you've got to find him. You've got to find him. And maybe he's looking. For you. How do I respond to, Frank, to Franklin's experience and solution for creating meaning in life, as well as other atheist approaches to creating meaning? Well, I've read Frankl. Frankl was uh, a Jewish writer who survived Auschwitz. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Um, just an incredible book, but also very heartbreaking because he gets so close and yet so far. Um, he, he, he remarks, if I remember correctly, about how people in the camps, so many of them in Auschwitz, found faith in God. You know, that's a remarkable thing. We would think something drives us away from God, but for many people it drives them to God. Uh, okay, I'm just about, I think, we are just about done. Yeah, I think we will, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. Friends, listen. This is so important. And I'll tell you why it's important. It's important because of the people I know who have committed suicide. It's important because of the people I see that their eyes, there's just, they're, they're filled with pain. It's important because of the anger that I see on social media. It's important because of each one of you. You have no idea how God has made you to be so glorious and beautiful but without Christ that cannot happen what we're doing here is this um, I bear no name a restaurant it's really bad if I name restaurants I want to name the restaurant people went home and tickets for it so maybe I'll do that later on but uh, I'll, I'll start naming some old whiskeys as well but no um, it's like we went to this restaurant not so long ago and it was three chairs we loved it and seriously, if you were sitting next to me on the train, I was going to tell you, the I was at this restaurant, you've got to go there. Part of me was a little bit selfish saying, don't go to your advisor, don't say anything. 
because you don't want to be able to go because you, you know, you want to be able to get a seat. But it was just lovely. And I think what we've got here in God's Word is this fantastic piece for a world that's starving. So hopefully see you next week at 12.15. We're going to go on to chapter 2, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And um, if we're fortunate, George will sing us the Rolling Stones version of that. Or, or I might get Rob Smith to do a bit better. But thank you very much. And please feel free to continue sending questions, comments, any suggestions. Bring a friend, bring your lunch. Um, feel free to hang around in the chat just now as well. The cathedral is a very, very open place. And you may leave by either door. And if you're waiting for the rain to stop, I would just pretend you're Scottish. If we wait for the rain to stop, we'd be in church for a decade. <laughs> <laughs>